Good evening. I'm Rachel Winheld, and I'm pleased to welcome you here this evening on behalf of Science at Cal and the Bay Area Science Festival. Science at Cal supports programs to engage and inform the public about the diversity of science research here at Berkeley, to make it accessible, and to share the wonder of science and its relevance to our daily lives. Please check out the Science at Cal website, scienceatcal.berkeley.edu, where you can meet Cal scientists, learn about their research, and sign up to, uh, to stay informed about our ongoing programs and opportunities for you to be involved. The Bay Area Science Festival is presented by Chevron and UC San Francisco. It's a 10-day celebration of science and technology going on throughout the Bay Area from Santa Rosa to San Jose. For more information on the 100 events that are taking place through November 6th, visit the Bay Area Science website at bayareascience.org. And now to the heart of the matter. Cosmology is one of the deepest issues in science. To ask where do we come from is also a very personal question, and one that religion also addresses. Tonight's speaker, an astrophysicist, a Buddhist monk, and a scholar of Jewish spirituality, are here to share their knowledge and their perspectives on the topic. To br briefly introduce them, Dr. Stephen Stoller is a research astronomer at UC Berkeley. Uh, his work focuses on the problem of star formation. In addition to research and teaching, Steve has co-authored an acclaimed text on the subject aptly titled The Formation of Stars. When you visit Steve's website, you'll also notice that he's also a very accomplished artist. Dr. Daniel Matt is a leading authority on Kabbalah. Daniel was professor of Jewish spirituality at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley for 20 years. A prolific author, he has published more than 10 books and has been honored with both the National Jewish Book Award and the Koret Jewish Book Award. His current project is an immense undertaking, the translation and annotation of the Zohar, the foundational work of the Kabbalah. Reverend Hung Shur is director of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. He holds a doctorate in religion from the Graduate Theological Union, where he co-teaches a course in, on Buddhist, and Christ, Buddhist Christian dialogue. He is fluent in Mandarin, Chinese, French, and Japanese. Reverend Hung Shur ordained in the Mahayana tradition of Chinese Buddhism, and he speaks around the world on diverse topics, such as human va values in a high-tech world. He is also an accomplished folk musician and storyteller. A word about the structure of this evening's program. We'll start with Steve, Daniel, and Hung Shur individually addressing the topic. This will be followed by a panel discussion. And then we'll open it up to you for your comments and questions. So let us begin. Our first speaker is Dr. Steven Stoller. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming here tonight. Cosmology is one of many areas in astrophysics today, but I think it's fair to say that it stands apart from all of the others. It's asking the biggest question of all, where did our universe come from? So it considers not just a process within the universe, but the entire thing, the universe as an entity, the development of that entity. So it's not odd that the answers that cosmologists gives us are pretty strange sounding things. Curved space and time, dark matter, dark energy, things like that. What I think is very strange is that science has any answers to these questions. Um, and it does. And I'm going to outline science's answer to the question of how we began tonight. Before I do that, I want to remark again on the strangeness of the theory. If you've ever read any pieces in the popular press about cosmology, that must strike you. It's not like any other theory of science. And that has to be, because it's asking such a deep question. On the other hand, having said that, I want to stress that all weird theories are not equal. <laughs> and the current weird theory that we call modern cosmology was forced upon scientists 
by the evidence that we see around us. So I'm going to outline that evidence for you. Another point that I have to make, even earlier, is our own insignificance in this whole business. Of course, in terms of our size, we're very small compared to even the Earth, much less a galaxy like the Milky Way, but our insignificance runs much deeper than that. We are insignificant also in our position in space and time. Until some 450 years ago, people thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. And then along came Copernicus, who debunked that idea, and showed that the Earth is just one of several pretty similar planets orbiting the Sun, our local star. So for a time, the Sun was elevated to a central position, that it remained there for a few centuries, and then it fell from that privileged place when it was shown that the Sun is just one of many, many stars within our galaxy, the Milky Way. How many similar stars to our Sun are there in the Milky Way? Only about a hundred billion. <laughs> so certainly the Sun is nothing special. That elevated the Milky Way for some time to a central position in the universe. It lasted, I don't know, half a century or so, and then along came people like Edwin Hubble, who showed us that we are surrounded by galaxies that look pretty much like our own Milky Way galaxy. We belong to something called the local group, which consists of a few dozen galaxies. Not too far away, there are clusters of galaxies containing hundreds of members, there are superclusters, and on and on. So our insignificance, both in space and in time, is extremely significant. <laughs> And any theory that does not put our insignificance front and center can't be right. All right, on to the evidence. There are three main lines of evidence for the current theory of cosmology. The first is that we are surrounded by a very weak form of electromagnetic radiation. It's bathing us all the time. It's in the microwave region of the spectrum. The wavelength, the peak wavelength, is about two millimeters. The, the radiation is so weak that it wasn't noticed for many, many years, and, and it was finally noticed in the 1960s. The important thing is, is that this radiation was predicted as the afterglow of the Big Bang, the explosion that started the whole universe, and it was predicted in 1948. Two scientists predicted the properties of the radiation, and about 15 years or so later, radiation with those properties was seen. Very strong evidence that there was a Big Bang. Item number two. In the picture of the Big Bang, that there was an initial ex universal explosion, it is predicted that the lightest elements of the periodic table would be created in the immediate aftermath of that explosion. The only elements that could be created that way were predicted to be Hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, the lightest on the periodic table. All the other elements in the periodic table were manufactured in the interiors of stars eons later. Just these elements. The theory predicted not only that they should be produced right after the Big Bang, but it predicted their relative abundances. They came out right. When you look and observe these elements out in space, in interstellar clouds and stars and so on, you get the correct abundances predicted by the Big Bang Theory, a very strong piece of evidence for the theory. And finally, item number three, and the most vivid of all, is the motion of galaxies, galaxies external to our Milky Way. When we look out at other galaxies, they don't like us. They're all running away from us. And the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's running away from us. Galaxies are all receding from us. This was Edwin Hubble's greatest discovery. And here is the graph from Hubble's original 1929 paper announcing this amazing finding. This is a plot of the speeds of a few dozen galaxies not too far away from us by today's standards as a function of their distance from us. And you can see there's a linear relationship between the two. The speed of recession of a galaxy is proportional to its distance from us. That's the famous Hubble law of expansion, of recession of galaxies. So what is the interpretation of this Hubble law of recession? Is it possible that some time ago, some billions of years ago, all of matter was crunched together where we are today? And then it spewed out with a range of speeds. Imagine that happening. So that today, the fastest moving objects would be the farthest away. 
The slowest would be the closest by. That would explain Hubble's law. Has anyone ever entertained that hypothesis for explaining this universal expansion? Not for a minute. It's not plausible because it makes us much too significant. There's nothing important about our location in space. We're absolutely insignificant. Let's turn the matter around. We do see, we do see galaxies receding from us in all directions. Since we are so insignificant, every observer in the universe must see exactly the same recession of galaxies. That assumption that there is a universal recession of galaxies to every conceivable observer, that's elevated to the name of the cosmological principle in theories of cosmology and forms the basis of all modern cosmology theories. But it's really just the principle of insignificance. Another way of putting it is this. Galaxies are not the important things. The fact that it's galaxies that are running away from us. Galaxies are just tracing motion. Motion of what? Motion of space. It's space itself that is expanding and is expanding to every observer in the universe. Space is expanding all around us. Galaxies are going along for the ride. So one needs to ask, is there a theory of physics which accounts for such a universal expansion of space? And remarkably enough, there is a theory of physics, and it was published only about a decade or so before Hubble's discovery of the recession of galaxies. And that theory of physics is Einstein's theory called general relativity. Now that is a theory of gravity. And you may well ask, what does gravity have to do with the expansion of anything? I thought gravity meant things are attracting, and it does. But the connection is that gravity, even though it's the weakest of all forces in nature, is the only force that has a range that reaches out to the galaxies and beyond. All the other forces don't do that. So galaxy is the, gravity is the only force that counts over cosmological distances. Now Einstein's theory of gravity is a strange one. He posited that space and time itself is kind of like a fabric or a membrane. And mass, matter, warps that membrane or fabric so that other particles of matter when they're nearby, follow curved paths that we call orbits as they are quote unquote attracted to that mass because of this warped space time. This theory, strange as it is, is the correct theory of gravity. It's been verified over and over again in all kinds of contexts that have nothing to do with cosmology. So we have to take it as the correct theory of gravity. Einstein, about a year or two after he discovered general relativity, applied it to the entire universe. He said, let me picture all of the matter in the universe. I'll idealize it as a uniform fluid. And then he used his own theory to predict how space and time and that fluid itself would evolve. And lo and behold, one of the solutions to his equations is that space should expand. And as space expands, the matter within that space should become less and less dense. So that's one rock, I would call it, on which modern cosmology stands. One extremely well-validated theory of physics, general relativity. And there's a second rock on which we stand. And that rock, equally well-validated, is thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, which was, came about in the 19th century, says, among other things, that a gas, as it expands, its density not only diminishes, its mass per volume, its energy also goes down, as it does work, pushing on its environment. In other words, its temperature falls, it gets cooler. So if we turn the movie backward to the early days of the universe, things were closer together, they were denser, and their temperature was higher. In other words, we came not just from a Big Bang, but a hot Big Bang. So here is the timeline that cosmologists offer us for the history of our universe. Everything started with the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago. That's called T equals zero here. That was a universal explosion seen by every conceivable observer, space bursting out all over. Within the first three minutes after that universal explosion, things had cooled down enough that the first elements could congeal out of this roiling plasma. And those elements were the hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium that I mentioned. After that, no more elements were produced cosmologically. After another 400,000 years, 
radiation, which had been trapped inside the matter, was able to break free because the density was now low enough. And that free-streaming radiation, that's what we see today as the microwave background that I mentioned. That's this afterglow of the Big Bang. After a few hundred million years, probably not before then, the first stars were created. We have evidence for massive stars being created at that time. We don't know if suns were created at that time, but they could well have been. We just don't know yet. About half of our cosmic lifetime ago, about seven billion years ago, this very strange and newly discovered stuff called dark energy came to the fore. It always existed, but it was a minor component of the universe until seven billion years ago, and then it became the predominant component of the universe, which it is today, and it's causing the expansion of the universe to pick up speed, to accelerate with time, a recently discovered phenomenon. Here is the cosmic census. This is what cosmologists tell us the universe is made from. So first of all, all of those millions and millions and millions of galaxies that I was talking about, if you lump them all together, they constitute exactly 4% of the mass of the universe, according to current theory. 22% of the universe is composed of something else called dark matter, otherwise called cold dark matter. And that is known to surround galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and it's known by its gravitational tug on the galaxies. And a whopping 74% of the universe is made of this ultra-strange stuff called dark energy, which is causing the expansion to pick up speed. So the theory has two darks in it that shouldn't be confused. There is dark matter, and we know about dark matter because of its gravitational tug on galaxies, and we're searching hard to find it. And there is dark energy, which is a completely different beast. Dark energy is it's known not from its effect on individual galaxies, but its effect on the expansion of the universe as a whole. Here I've pictured us at the center of our own local expansion, seeing the galaxies racing away from us. If we look at a galaxy quite far away, we find that its recession speed is not as big as it should be according to the older theory. It's not moving away from us quite as fast. Therefore, we must be expanding today faster. In other words, the expansion has picked up speed and it's accelerating. Dark energy accounts for that acceleration. Is this a complete theory in any sense of the universe? Of course not. Of course not. It posits right away that 96% of the mass in the universe is completely unknown. We have no idea what most of the universe is made out of. And I want to add, finally, that it, I don't think it's complete philosophically either, and I'll add just some personal qualms I have about modern cosmology. First of all, there certainly was a Big Bang. There's no question the evidence is overwhelming and has been for a century. Was there one Big Bang? All the evidence says there was. There's no evidence that the universe will recontract and experience a big crunch followed by another Big Bang. But doesn't that make us too significant? Doesn't that give us a stamp in time? It says we are dated at t equals plus 14 billion years. But we have no particular place spatially. We have no special position spatially, as I've shown you. That's been demonstrated over and over again. Why should we have a special place in time? I don't know the answer. Another qualm I have is with the very concept of dark energy. What is it? As we look for it and search for different candidates for dark energy, consider how very strange it is. It's picking up energy just by the act of expansion, kind of bootstrapping its way up to higher and higher energies, and it's not getting that energy from any place else, because around it is more dark energy that's also sucking up its own energy and bootstrapping its way up. So somehow, energy is being created out of, I don't know. And finally, you will hear a general comment you will hear in cosmology discussions far stranger ideas that I'm telling you about tonight. For example, you'll hear that we are one of an infinite number of universes that have come and gone with their own big bangs and so on. Is there any evidence that we have other universes out there? None. So take these ideas with a grain of salt. Listen to the ideas for which there is testable evidence, ideas that are testable for which there is evidence, because as I think I've 
told you tonight, those ideas, testable ideas with hard evidence, are strange and wonderful enough as it is. Thank you. In the beginning was the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago. The primordial vacuum was devoid of matter, but not really empty, rather in a state of minimum energy, teeming with virtual particles. Through a quantum fluctuation, there emerged a hot, dense seed, smaller than a proton, yet containing all the mass and energy of our universe. In less than a trillionth of a second, this seed cooled and expanded wildly. The expansion then slowed down, but it has never stopped. In its first few seconds, the universe was an undifferentiated soup of matter and radiation. It took a few minutes for things to cool down enough for nuclei to form, and at least 300,000 years for atoms to form. For eons, clouds of gas expanded. Huge balls of hot gas formed into stars. Deep within these stars, nuclear reactions gave birth to elements such as carbon and iron. When the stars grew old, they exploded, spewing these elements into the universe. Eventually, this matter was recycled into new solar systems. We, along with everything else, are literally made of stardust. Can this theory of the Big Bang be harmonized with the biblical account of creation? Only if we interpret Genesis metaphorically. If God spoke the world into being, the divine language is energy. The alphabet, elementary particles. God's grammar, the laws of nature. Many scientists have sensed a spiritual dimension in the search for these laws. For Einstein, Discerning the laws of nature was a way to discover how God thinks. But does the universe have a purpose? Is there meaning to our existence? Here, cosmology cannot help us very much. Darwin intensifies our problem. Are we different from other animals? Can we transcend violence and savagery? As the wife of an Anglican bishop remarked upon hearing of Darwin's theory, Descended from apes? My dear, let us hope that it is not true. But if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. <laughs> Her comment echoes the fear that knowing the true nature of our ancestors threatens to unravel the social fabric. Many people today believe in science rather than in the God of religion. And what does science provide in exchange for this belief? Progress in every field except for one, the ultimate meaning of life. The Big Bang is a contemporary creation story. Energy turns into matter, which turns back into energy. There is no precise plan. By a combination of chance and necessity, humanity has evolved from and alongside countless other forms of life. Ultimately, our evolutionary history is uplifting. It enables us to see with, that we are part of a wholeness, a oneness. In the words of one physicist, to be religious means to have an intuitive feeling of the unity of the cosmos. This oneness is grounded in scientific fact. We are made of the same stuff as all of creation. Everything that is, was, or will be started off together as one infinitesimal point the cosmic seed. Life has since branched out, but this should not blind us to its underlying unity. The deepest marvel is the unity in diversity, the vast array of material manifestations of energy. Becoming aware of this multifaceted unity can help us learn how to live in harmony with other human beings and with all beings. 
If the Big Bang is our new creation myth, then who is God? God is a name we give to the oneness of it all. Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition, creates various names for God. One is Ein Sof, the infinite. Or to borrow a phrase from the Christian mystic Meister Eckhart, the God beyond God. Sometimes the Kabbalists use a more radical name than Ein Sof. This is the name Ayin, nothingness. To call God nothingness does not mean that God does not exist. Rather, it conveys the idea that God is no thing. God animates all things and cannot be contained by any of them. God is the oneness that is no particular thing, no thingness. This mystical nothingness is not empty or barren. It is fertile and overflowing, engendering the myriad forms of life. The mystics teach that the universe emanated from divine nothingness. Similarly, cosmologists speak of the quantum vacuum, teeming with potential, engendering the cosmic seed. How did the universe emerge out of prolific nothingness? Both Kabbalah and Big Bang theory teach that this transition was marked by a single point. Physicists call this point a singularity an infinitely dense point in space-time. A singularity is both destructive and creative. Anything falling into a singularity merges with it, losing its identity, while energy emerging from a singularity can become anything. According to one medieval Kabbalist, the beginning of existence is the secret concealed point. This is the beginning of all the hidden things, which spread out from there and emanate, according to their species. As emanation proceeds, the point expands into a circle. Similarly, ever since the Big Bang, our universe has been expanding. We know this thanks to the astronomer Edwin Hubble, who determined that the farther a galaxy is from us, the faster it's moving away. The universe is expanding in all directions. If the universe is now expanding, that means it was once much smaller. If we go back far enough, the entire mass energy of the universe contracts into the size of an infinitesimal point from which the cosmos flashed into existence. One Kabbalist, writing in the 16th century, understands expansion as part of the rhythm of creation. With the appearance of the light, the universe expanded. With the concealment of the light, the things that exist were created in all their variety. How did matter emerge from energy? The mystic writes that the light was concealed. A scientist would say that energy congealed. Matter is frozen energy. No atom could form until some energy cooled down enough that it could be bundled into stable particles of matter. Einstein discovered the equivalence of mass and energy. Ultimately, matter is not distinct from energy, but simply energy that has assumed a particular pattern. Matter is energy in a tangible form. Both are different states of a single continuum, different names for two forms of the same thing. The mystic, too, is fascinated by the relation of matter and energy. Material existence emerges out of the pool of divine energy. Ultimately, the world is not other than God, for this energy is concealed within all forms of being. If it were not concealed, there could be no individual existence. Everything would dissolve back into oneness or nothingness. Kabbalah poses the question, what came before creation? The answer is that originally there was only Ein Sof, God as infinity. But how then could there be room for anything other than God? Well, the first act of creation was not emanation, the divine flow, but rather withdrawal, by which God fashioned a void that could house the cosmos. Yet this was not really empty. It retained a residue of divine light just as the vacuum preceding the Big Bang was not completely empty, but rather in a state of minimum energy, 
pregnant with potential. According to Kabbalah, a ray of light was channeled into the void through vessels. But some of these vessels could not withstand the power of the light, and they shattered. Consequently, sparks of light fell and were eventually trapped in all material existence. Our task is to liberate these sparks of light, to restore them to divinity by living ethically and spiritually. If the vessels had not broken, our world of multiplicity would not exist. We exist because we have lost oneness. Modern cosmology has a theory that parallels this breaking of the vessels, the theory of broken symmetry. The universe began in an extremely hot state of simplicity and symmetry. As it expands and cools, this perfect symmetry is broken, giving rise to the world of diversity that we inhabit. To us today, the fundamental forces of nature appear distinct. Gravity, electromagnetism, and two other forces known as the strong and weak nuclear forces. But originally, all four forces were linked. Imagine yourself journeying back in time, closer and closer to the moment of the Big Bang. The further you go, the hotter and denser the universe becomes, and broken symmetries are restored. You go back millions, billions of years. Finally, you reach the tiniest fraction of time that a physicist can imagine, 10 to the minus 43 second after the Big Bang. That's a 10 millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the beginning. Earlier than this is hard to probe. <laughs> Why? The density of matter becomes so great that the structure and perhaps the meaning of space and time break down. At this point, all interactions between the fundamental forces are indistinguishable. Perfect symmetry. Then as the early universe expanded and started to cool, the various forces became distinct. This fracturing of symmetry created particles of matter and energy. We exist today with all our imperfections because of broken symmetry. Just as Kabbalah teaches that our jumbled reality derives from the breaking of the vessels. Broken symmetry and the breaking of the vessels are distinct theories, yet they resonate. The human mind, apparently, has devised alternative strategies, spiritual and scientific, to search for our origin. The two are quite different, but complementary. Science enables us to probe infinitesimal particles of matter, and vast depths of outer space, understanding each in light of the other as we grope our way back toward the beginning. Spirituality guides us through inner space, challenging us to rediscover oneness and to live in its light. As we've seen, the Jewish mystics picture divine sparks in everything that exists. A scientist might say there is energy latent in subatomic particles. The spiritual task is to raise the sparks, to restore the world to God, to become aware that every single thing we do or see or touch or imagine is part of the oneness, a pattern of energy. Raising the sparks is a powerful metaphor. It transforms religion from a list of do's and don'ts or a list of dogmas into spiritual adventure. God is not some separate being up there. She is right here, in the bark of a tree, in a friend's voice, in a stranger's eye. The world is teeming with God. Since God is in everything, you can serve God through everything. In looking for the divine spark, we discover that what is ordinary is spectacular. The holy deed is doing what needs to be done now. The world is fractured, and God needs us to mend it. In mending the world socially, economically, politically, we mend God, whose sparks lie scattered everywhere. We are part of a vast web, constantly expanding and evolving. Gazing at the nighttime sky, 
We can ponder that we are made of elements forged within stars, out of particles born in the Big Bang. We can sense that we are actually looking back home. The further we gaze into space, the further we see back into time. If we see a galaxy 10 million light years away, we're really seeing that galaxy as it was 10 million years ago because it's taken that long for its ancient light to arrive here. Beyond any star we will ever identify lies the horizon of space-time, 14 billion light years away. But neither God nor the Big Bang is that far away. The Big Bang didn't happen somewhere out there, outside of us. Rather, we began inside the Big Bang. We now embody its primordial energy. The Big Bang has never stopped. And what about God? God is not an object or a fixed destination. There's no definite way to reach God. But then again, you don't need to reach something that's everywhere. God is not somewhere else hidden from us. God is right here hidden from us. We are enslaved by routines, rushing from event to event. We rarely let ourselves pause and notice the splendor right in front of us. Our sense of wonder has shriveled, victimized by our pace of life. How then can we find God? One clue is provided by one of the many names of Shekhinah, the feminine aspect of God, the divine presence. In Kabbalah, she is called ocean, well, garden, apple orchard. She's also called by the Hebrew word zot, which means simply this. God is right here, in this very moment, fresh and unexpected, taking you by surprise. God is this. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Was that trick or treat? No, no, no I don't think so. No trick or treat. The Buddha's description of the creation of the universe, or more accurately, multiverse, is that there is no beginning and no end. Now, while that, in the context of tonight, science at Cal and the Bay Area Science Festival, might be difficult to wrap our minds around, so too is the notion of a beginning and an end. What could precede a beginning? Science and religion tackle the biggest questions of all, so fasten your seatbelt. I'm going to move quickly in my presentation of the Buddhist description of the beginning of the universe to a textual tradition as expressed in the Flower Garland Sutra, known as the Avatamsaka. To what the Buddha said about creation, continuous continuity, continuous creativity, one, two, a million big bangs, happening concurrently with each new intentional thought. In other words, from this perspective, from this model, Creation was not a historical event, not a noun, but a verb, creating. In fact, an ongoing process of codependent origination. Now, the Buddha proposed cycles rather than a linear beginning. This theoretical model, inasmuch as the Big Bang, solid state theory of Fred Hoyle, much discredited, and the quasi-solid-state cosmology that evolved from that are all also 
theoretical models, models in flux that evolve with each deeper probe into space with more and more sophisticated instruments. I remember in 2002 watching the, uh, hearing the, the hair-raising cheers that came out of the laboratory after the first Hubble adjustment mission. Did anybody see that? It's on YouTube, by the way. That thrill when suddenly, after the corrections, it came into focus. And here were these very respectable, very dignified professors just shouting, yay, as these images came into sharp focus. Since then, there have been uh, several such missions and uh, met with equal enthusiasm. So uh, worlds come into being, worlds dwell, worlds decay and go void, all based on the principle of karma. The Buddha framed it in a way that is not static. These dynamic cycles of change move. They are infinitely responsive. Karma and the conscious multiverse need some definition. This, is, this word has already made it into the lexicon because it's shared alike with the, the Hindu classical texts. Karma is behavior and its results, habitual behavior. Bodily actions, spoken words, intentional thoughts. These create seeds that later bear fruit. That's probably the simplest uh, broad brush definition of karma. Karma is activity based on desire, governed by the Buddhist law of causality. The analogy of gardening comes to mind right away. Plant beans, get beans. Plant apples, get, get apples. It's not the case that you can plant beans and get apples. Seeds planted in the past bring present harvest. Seeds planted in the, in the present will bring a future harvest. Neither good nor bad, simply responsive to the seed. And according to this model, karma is the primary force that keeps us in the cycle of rebirth, true for individuals, true for worlds. A quote from this Avatamsaka Sutra says, according with the karma that is done, thus the retribution comes about. The doer does not exist. All Buddhas explain karma in this way. So, Worlds and sentient beings come into being by a force, not a bang, excuse me, more like a whimper, in fact, but by the karma of living beings. Okay, let's check in here. No beginning, no end, dynamic, not static, constantly in change. Change governed by laws of causality, codependent origination. Now, from the Buddhist perspective, it is entirely possible that there could be a Big Bang. In no sense is this canceled or, or, or denied, but to have it be a single originating event with a linear trajectory that, that would be happening in one corner, much as uh, Professor Stoller told us, how insignificant would we be? So, centuries ago, it was not intuitive from our frame of reference to say that the world rotated on its axis, nor that it orbited around the sun. This was considered absurd and counterintuitive. But our frame of reference has shifted. Physics has undergone two major revolutions, the Galilean, the Einsteinian, after which nothing was the same. Old points of view were no longer valid from that time on. So hearing this model proposed, I'm sure that some of you, as I am, are asking the question, how could what we observe at this macro level through our instruments that can measure redshift and the cooling of electromagnetic fields into galaxies, how could we see something as tiny as consciousness and human intentionality? So the Buddha did not, in fact, ask us to take it on his authority. There's a famous text called the Kalama Sutra where he gives us the opportunity to test for ourselves. He said, do not believe these claims simply because it is a tradition maintained by oral repetition. Do not believe these claims 
just because there is an unbroken succession of practice. Do not believe these claims merely because it is hearsay. Do not believe these claims because they're in the scriptures, and so forth. We have a total of nine reasons why not to believe anything he has said. Do, concluding with, do not believe just because, quote, our teacher says thus and thus. Whenever you realize by yourself that these are unwholesome, harmful, or condemned by wise people, and whoever fully or undertake or observe these claims lead to uselessness and suffering, you should abandon these claims. However, whenever we realize by ourselves that these are wholesome, unharmful, and are admired by wise people, whoever fully undertake or observe them, that they lead to usefulness and happiness, you should undertake them. So the Buddha is pulling the rug on his own theoretical model, asking us to verify it in ourselves. Now that moves me to the second point that I would like to make, that the Buddha's model at all times stresses the primacy of perception. That's echoed in a quote from a classical Chinese text called the Guanzi that says, what all people seek to know is that, but our means of knowing that is this. How can we know that? Only by mastering and perfecting this. Now, in the, the science that I was trained in, wanted to have me believe in what we might call scientific materialism. The idea that the real world exists consisting of mind-independent objects. We might also say that there's a law of scientific materialism that says there's actually one true and complete description of how the real world is. Three, we might say, truth involves some sort of correspondence between an existing world and our description of it. And four, that it is not only possible but desirable for scientists and scholars to describe the world from the God's eye viewpoint of a completely detached and objective and value neutral observer. So can I give you those as the laws of scientific materialism? The Buddha said indeed that without a telescope, math or science of astronomy, but with some very sophisticated methods for exploring the space of the mind and its relationship to the surrounding environment, we can indeed make perception primary. Here is the model. He says the physical world as we experience it, called the kamadhatu, the desire realm, the material realm, the realm of the senses, is an emerging realm, not fundamental, not baseline, out of which everything else emerges. So in other words, perception, the sense, the world of, uh, the, the world that reported to us by the senses is an emergent property. It comes forth from an underlying realm that is prior to and more fundamental than our human construct of mind and matter. That would be the rupa data, known as the form realm. Now, we hear that and we think platonic, we think even Pythagorean, some pure form that is, uh, uh, mathematically derivable. It is something prior to, however, that rupa datu arises from something prior to and more fundamental than the form realm. That is the arupa datu, which we might correlate to pure mathematics, no forms whatsoever. So this is the Buddha's model. He says, perfect this if we would like to know that. The Buddha himself came up with this notion and hundreds of generations of yogis have corroborated it exactly as described 
It arises not from mathematical formula, but from experience. Deep meditation states where consciousness shuts down and the psyche implodes into a substrate consciousness known as the alaya, the storehouse consciousness that is the repository for what are known as bijas or seeds, impressions. The substrate consciousness is the portal to the form realm. Deeper states open a portal to the formless realm. And all these have been extensively mapped. Now, I'm presenting this model for your contemplation. Notice that at no time have I mentioned anything supernatural, anything mystical. Indeed, this is based entirely on empirical observation and experience. And the Buddha would say, come and taste. Come and experience yourself. Which leads me to the third point, that I think without apology, we can present this 2,500 year old model as an ancient technology. A technology used in the common laboratory of human consciousness. So, if this is the case then, we can ask ourselves, indeed, what does it matter? The uh, last, part of the last part of our topic tonight was, what does it matter? The model I want to present here is that this description of the universe's arising, dwelling, decaying, and going void is a profoundly sentient and kind construction, if I can say so. Dependent origination begins, and I'm really compelled by Professor Stoller's talk, to equate, although this is very suggestive, and I think I, I need to be careful, but this might come up in our, in our com conversation later. The notion that dark matter might be what the Buddha called avidya, ignorance. It's a very suggestive notion. Ignorance arises from desire. Now, The laboratory that the Buddha proposed, the laboratory of common consciousness, where, this, uh, where the investigation in, and observance of the arising of uh, experience from karma is based upon ancient technologies that begin with moral precepts. Now, we didn't hear from Professor Matt, perhaps later we can, about the uh, Kabbalah students of Isaac Luria, the 16th century mystic from Soft, who demanded before his students uh, practice their uh, investigations in Kabbalah that they adhere to a strict ethical discipline, that there were rules of behavior that calmed the mind, that allowed the insights to rise. This indeed is the ancient mind science technology that is profoundly moral in nature. The Buddha described it in three ways, character, concentration, and insight. Shila, samadhi, and prajna. So in fact, samadhi stillness is the source of the transformation of consciousness into wisdom, but samadhi has its source in the purity of disciplined sense observation. So if we can borrow this method, borrow this notion, that uh, shila, samadhi, and prajna, character, stillness, and insight is the source of the wisdom that uh, creates wholesome human beings. Then consciousness transforms into wisdom from, uh, for generations. Now, I wanted to uh, tell a story. I did, uh, in my formation as a monk 35 years ago, I did a pilgrimage at one point uh, where I my practice entailed silence for, for six years. And the silence allowed me to observe the rising of, of uh, thoughts in the mind and reactions to the senses. And at one point in Big Sur, uh, 
a man rode by on a bicycle. Uh, I was there bowing with my, my monk colleague. And he said, uh, been watching you fellows bow along Highway 1 here. And uh, he said, uh, I want you to know that I'm also a meditator, he said. I'm actually a scientist with NASA, but uh, I'm very interested in what you all might be discovering here as you bow. And uh, of course, I couldn't speak, but my colleague could. And so he said, oh, you're a scientist with NASA. Well, tell me, what do you do all day? He said, well, we're here uh, on the peak. The weather is really good for astronomical observation here. He said, we can see to the edge of the universe now. And my colleague, who had a background in science, said, oh, actually, he said, uh, I didn't realize the universe had an edge, he said. <laughs> and the astronomer said, well, actually, he said, in all honesty, that is the case. Every time we invent a bigger telescope, we discover that the universe had a bigger edge than we thought, farther away. And so uh, my companion, uh, Hung Chao, said, well, he said, actually, I'll tell you the truth. What I understand is that we're doing the same job. And the astronomer said, how do you mean? He said, we're both looking into space. The only difference is the Buddhists turn the telescope around, he said. And the astronomer said, yes, he said, that's why I'm meditating. I just want to start by remarking that I'm very much struck by how cold scientific cosmology is compared to <laughs> religious cosmologies. The universe, as given to us by science, is a very foreboding place. There's really no morality in it. There's no ethics. There's no consciousness to it. There's no real direction. It's all rather accidental. And one of the things that I prominently mentioned in my talk was our own insignificance as both as human beings, as a species, even as a planet or a galaxy. We're so small, we just can't count. And I wanted the reaction of my colleagues here to that very broad statement. How does that sit with you in terms of religion? Because it strikes me that religion is in a sense the opposite of that, where things are emanating from us outward. I think, you know, it, it, seems, it seems to me that, it, that it's relative to say insignificant or significant. I think it's useful to emphasize, as you did, the insignificance because of the traditions that we've, that, with which we were indoctrinated, that we are the center of the universe or that we're the pinnacle of creation. In order to undercut those you know, mythological statements, I think it's useful to emphasize insignificance. Mm -hmm. But you can go overboard with insignificance and fall into you know, negativity or pessimism or depression. So I think the, I think the trick is to, is to find a balance between the significance and insignificance, of trying to, to dwell, you know, as Hung Shur would say, you know, to, to find the, the balance not to, not to veer too, too far to the right or the left. It's a wonderful Hasidic uh, story. There was one Hasidic Rebbe who said he, he kept two notes, one note in each pocket. In one pocket was the note, Anochi uh, afar va'efer, I am dust and ashes. And the other pocket had the note, Bishvili nivraha olam, for me the universe was created. <laughs> So, you know, to, to somehow believe, to somehow believe both, and as soon as you find yourself believing in one too much, to, to find that balance, I think that, that seems to me a, a, good, a good spiritual exercise. Size, I think, as, as, as Professor Matt said, is, is really relative. Um, the, the idiom that came to my mind was uh, the... Uh, the Chan or Zen aphorism that says, Xin Dong, Bai Shi Yo, Xin Jing, Wan Shi Wu. When the mind moves, implied because of desire, selfish desire, in pursuit of 
of uh, something outside, then a hundred things arise. In other words, all the trouble begins with the first movement of the mind. But as soon as the mind is still, all the myriad matters cease. So when I'm meditating, sometimes I find myself completely uh, out of sync with the world around me because of all the, the scattered discursive thoughts running through. And yet, when I catch myself and remind myself to just focus on counting my breath or whatever meditative technique I might be employing, suddenly I find myself, all the boundaries of the self dissolve and I'm completely one with the universe. So I, I can't find my self, the small self, anywhere at that point. So uh, the notion that somehow our own uh, measurable, observable Big Bang uh, is too small to matter, it, it might be the only show in town, you know, uh, and, or it could provide the model for infinite numbers of Big Bangs replicating in infinite ways throughout the universe. So if you have a piece of one, you have everything. Well, as I hinted in my remarks at the end, I have a lot of sympathy for that. I think that the modern cosmology, the scientific cosmology, is too historical. It, the timeline is too definitive in terms of a beginning. We don't have, in, 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 according to the present notion, there is no end. Space is, the expansion is speeding up. We don't know if there is one. But I'm very troubled by the fact that the Big Bang is a historical event. I don't, th that doesn't sit right with me. And both of you said in your own ways that you, you look at the, the universe and cosmology not as a historical event, but as a continuing process. And I'm quite sympathetic with that, and moreover think science could use more of that point of view. Not just in discerning or investigating what happened, say, before the Big Bang or far into the future, but somehow we have to get a larger perspective. I think science is impoverished in that way, personally. When you, you talked about, I think you called it, uh, Hung Shur, codependent. Uh, origination. Right. Could you amplify that a bit? What do you mean by codependent? Codependent origination is the notion that um, subject and object arise together. That uh, this is in fact kind of the signature uh, notion of that flower adornment sutra, the flower garland sutra, the avatamsaka, is that, uh, what would you say, uh, that without matter there is no mind. When you can, as I said, stop the mind, then all of the creative processes, uh, all of the karma ceases. And so the universe, there, there is no matter at that point. The world is over. The door to, in, in Buddhist jargon, the door to liberation opens at that point. And yet as soon as, uh, as soon as the mind moves, as soon as I, from that Let's say, I, I would love to talk, a longer talk about dark matter and ignorance, avidya being that big piece of the pie that is dark matter. Uh, there's a Buddhist model that is very compelling. I, I would hesitate to, to name it as equivalent, but it's, it's very compelling. Um, as soon as in the midst of that darkness, desire stimulates something in my mind, for example, meditating, I smell lunch. All right, as soon as the smell of lunch touches my nostrils, right away, mind moves, right away, thoughts, projections, time, my nose, my ears, my body, I start to get nervous, and I start to sweat thinking lunch is, how, how much longer? Did he, is he asleep? Why doesn't he ring the bell, you know? So the hundred things arise with that, out of ignorance, that first touch. And so if I can let that uh, olfactory sense experience come through, and catch the mind before it reacts and creates the hundred things, then it's all gone. So mind and matter arise simultaneously. Nose and all and uh, and scent, smell data create themselves, create themselves together, codependent arising. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What, what's the relation of mind and matter in Kabbalah? Um. I guess I'd, I'd come to, back to the, to the word intention that Tung Shur uh, mentioned briefly. It's really a central idea in, in traditional Judaism and maybe more so in Jewish mysticism. It's called kavana, literally means direction or, or intention. So the, the, 
what you intend with your mind is, is the most important thing. As one Hasidic master said, uh, as a person thinks, there he is. So you put yourself in a state, you put yourself somewhere in the universe because of your thought. It takes us back to significance and insignificance. If you, if you intend something meaningful, you make your life meaningful. If you think, you know, I'm, I'm nothing in this vast universe, you easily fall into, into that negativity, into that nihilism. But, you know, if we're really made of the same stuff as all of creation, then I think there, there's, uh, there's a sense in which we're, we're part of the whole, we're part of the one. If, if infinity, you know, I, I know very little mathematics, but I know that a fraction of infinity is infinite. So we're a tiny part of this infinite whole, this infinite oneness. That, over, that really overcomes the, the insignificance. Mm -hmm. Steve, I'm going to ask you one. Okay. Right. Of course. In uh, preparation for tonight, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to learn more uh, about uh, astronomy's description of the Big Bang and all. And one of the most fascinating things that, that came was the, this uh, experience with Hubble called the Deep Field Probe that took a tiny slice, seemingly a dead, nothing going on slice, about what one-tenth of the diameter of the moon, and found in it 12,000 galaxies. And the, the statement was that in, they, they, uh, Hubble made a million seconds worth of passes in order to catch and one photon per second, one lucky photon, made its way into Hubble's you know, sensing mirror. And from that, this, the claim was made that you could see galaxies that were adolescent galaxies, and galaxies that were, uh, what, young adult galaxies. Right. And you know, I couldn't, couldn't get it. Could you, would you flesh that out a bit? Well, you How said it work? in your presentation, or when you, when, or both of you actually mentioned it, when we look at something 10 million years, 10 million light years away, we're seeing the object as it was 10 million years ago, not at present. The farther away an object is, the older it is. So that we, when but, we, but, but, the farther away it is, the older it is because because of expansion. the travel time, expansion and the time, okay, got both it. the travel time of light and the expansion. It's expanded okay. away from us, and it takes mm -hmm. eons for the light to reach us. Got it. So we are presently seeing it is true. When we look back to things, it's very hard to bend your mind around this, I understand. Mm -hmm. But when you look very far away to where the universe was very young, right. okay, when the universe was a fraction of its size today, we actually do see galaxies change at that point. We do see the morphologies, the shapes of galaxies. And this is pretty recent stuff. We can see an evolution of galaxies. And we're beginning to piece together how the galaxies came to be in their present status. There are different types of galaxies that I won't get into, and no one really understands how that came to be. We're beginning to understand that, and we see these extremely young galaxies that, by the way, tend to be much more active than our own galaxy. There was a lot of activity at the very beginning. We're cooling off in many senses, even in terms of individual galaxies. Quasars, if you know about them, were extremely active galaxies many, many eons ago, and we can see them. They're the most powerful sources of radiation mm -hmm. in the universe. And they existed a long time ago, and they've cooled down. We have little remnants of them today. So there was this buzz of activity all around us, all the time, in this very dense universe, and we're cooling off, according to cosmology. Got it. Hmm. I think dark, you, met, you asked about dark matter and dark energy and darkness, it very much is equated to ignorance for us because dark is just a placeholder word for us. No one expects it. it dark has the equivalence of phlogiston, if you know that, what that was for heat several centuries ago. It's just a placeholder until we find out what it is. I caution that some of the, one of the darks, I think, is so strange that we may not find what it is. But one of them, for sure, we will find, and probably in the not distant future. So we're certainly ignorant of this dark matter, and it's we're, according to the picture that cosmology offers us, we are just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. We are surrounded by this sea of darkness. I wonder if we might open this up to the audience for questions. 
Absolutely. Um, Aki is uh, Yeah, hi. Can you raise your hand if you have a comment or a question? Aki will bring the microphone yeah. to you. Let me run down the front here. Yeah, I'm Lawrence, and um, I think I've got the mathematical solution from quantum mechanics to the quandary here, which is Schrodinger's cat expanded to Schrodinger's universe. The universe doesn't exist unless it has an observer. So when you go back to the question to the beginning, you don't go back to the Big Bang, you go back to the beginning of consciousness. And so essentially, from say using modern word hologram, you start with white noise and then mathematically move away from it. So you just get a sparse thing, a few particles, and then it gets more and more complicated. And when you do that, you can actually generate uh, an image of the universe which has chemistry and biology and, and cosmology and all, all different uh, aspects that we actually see. So would you posit that consciousness existed before brains? It doesn't require making any one of many, one, one can take many different philosophical viewpoints about, you know, um, duality, materialism, it doesn't really matter mathematically. It's just mathematically, what you're doing going back to something which uh, you learned in elementary school, which is you, you, you can't down, write uh, infinite numbers of numbers with infinite precision because you run off the sides of the page. And when we do quantum mechanics, we use infinite dimensional vector spaces over real numbers of infinite precision. And this, I mean, it's useful to simplify the algebra, but it's essentially false in, in, in the sense that uh, if you assume that you're working with finite precision and f finite dimensional spaces, then you suddenly get a bunch of mathematical tools which allows you to calculate fundamental constants. And then you really do get all these different uh, scientific di disciplines we see. More questions, comments? Not nearly so um, insightful, but I had a, a question that probably relates to that 96% ignorance that, that uh, anybody that's been in a graduate program is fully aware of, but um, <laughs> I was wondering, in a world where things are so weird that even your, when you said uh, the vacuum before the Big Bang, and ultimately you were using both uh, vacuum and um, before, metaphorically, as Professor Stoller would advise, I, I sometimes wonder if, if uh, just as Einstein didn't really overthrow Newton, but merely added some refinements, you know. Yeah, merely, in the sense that, that here was this thing that says when we're uh, on the flat of the earth, it looks flat. When we're looking out, it looks like we're the center. And things get weird for the Ptolemaic system. And so somebody says, well, this makes the math look simpler. And Einstein, you know, what do we do with the ether? Well, this makes the math look simpler. And so Newton is kind of, yeah, simpler. It's a higher order term that got, that wasn't important. I guess isn't an awful lot of our uh, weirdness of dark matter and dark energy based on the assumption that our scale is somehow significant, that the things that we see real close to us, you know, a few million light years or whatever we can um, figure out with, you know, uh, sea feed variables or something, is special. And that maybe there isn't some higher order terms to Newton, just like Einstein added, that make these uh, things nonlinear. Um, isn't, is there any, uh, you know, I think it's, the, in a sense, it's the opposite, that the darks are posited to fill in the space beyond, that going well beyond our local experience, we need these dark substances to fill in the universe, so to speak, to give it the completeness that theory demands, even when there's no direct evidence, there's no evidence for dark energy other than this acceleration of the universe. 
So we don't directly see it in any sense. It's dark in many ways. But it's called for to fill in the picture on the largest possible scales. The farthest away we can see, we see that things are, as I said in my talk, are retreating from us, yes, but not retreating as fast as they should be retreating. I, I would like to stick my hand in the air, and I'll make this quick, because we want as many questions as possible. But I have a question for Professor Matt, which was, um, I so much appreciated your beautiful uh, portrait of God. And you notice that the God, the, the Ein Sof, and the Ein, the, these uh, ancient, ancient words for the all in all, um, didn't give us any kind of a patriarchal, long-bearded, angry fellow, you know, <laughs> sitting there uh, creating things. So creator was nowhere, not, nowhere to be found and yet unavoidable. Not for a second can you get away from her. And I very much appreciated the change of the pronoun. And uh, I just wanted to toss that out. Did anybody notice that nowhere tonight was there uh, any creator being proposed? And how does that sit with uh, so many of the world's religious individuals and scientists as well who are very happy to have someone in charge? Let me just say, you know, that's really a problem for the, for the Kabbalists, too, because the Kabbalists, in, in one sense, were radical mystics, but the word Kabbalah also means tradition, literally that which has been received. So they, they you know, they prayed three times a day, they studied the Bible daily and weekly, they believed, in a sense, the literal meaning, too. How could they possibly speak of God as infinity or nothingness and deal with the first verse in Genesis, in the beginning, in the beginning. God created? So what they do is they, they employ imagination. I think imagination is the key for you know, reconciling religion and science. Hmm. It's an imaginative reading of the Bible. So they would say Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it doesn't mean in the beginning God created. It actually means in the beginning it created God. Ah. There is a creator, but God's actually the object of creation. That sounds heretical. That's so Buddhist, Danny. It, <laughs> it, it, actually, it actually fits the Hebrew of Genesis better if you have a kind of a hyper-literal reading. Bereshit, in the beginning. Bara, it created. Elohim, God. God follows the verb, doesn't precede the verb. Now in Hebrew, it's okay for the subject to come after the verb. But the Zohar says, no, let's read it exactly in the order it appears. In the beginning, it created God, meaning in Sof, infinity, emanated or became what we think of as God. And does so, it play a role thereafter? It, it is the unnameable God. Which God is, the infinity really cannot be named. It's given in Sof almost as a placeholder, kind of like dark, mm -hmm. but really it's, it's the, the, the nameless. So there's no subject there, but in Hebrew, the, the, verb, the verb can mean created and it created. But there's no need to, to spell out the it. It re remains this infinite, nameless divinity. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But I think that's really a, a, a vital element. In, in for A religion cannot stay alive unless it reinvents itself, unless it employs imaginative interpretation. And uh, that's, that's one example. Yeah, I, know, I also noted in your talk, you, you mentioned several times continuous creation, and mm -hmm. that God is in all of us, and that we are continually being created. In a sense, one of the things I like about the strange dark energy concept, as, as odd as it is, is it, it smacks of that in a way. It reminds me of that, mm. that energy is being somehow regenerated continually. And we need it. We need it to explain this very strange fact of the expansion not only continuing, persevering, but picking up speed. And if that turns out to be true, as the Nobel Prize Committee just said it was true a few weeks ago, <laughs> weeks if ago. it continues to be hold, then this something like this is needed, some continuous mm -hmm. input of creation or energy. Let's get another comment from the audience. Yes, um, this kind of follows from what you've been saying, because I'm Gonna, it's going to be a little bit challenging, but uh, science is based on a fundamental faith assumption, 
One, that there's intelligibility in the universe. You can discover laws, how it operates. And that human beings, the second faith assumption is that human beings have the intelligence to discover that intelligibility. Without those two assumptions, science would be impossible. And many historians of science have pointed out that underlying all this is the basic Judeo-Christian presumption that the universe was created by a rational creator who created through his word and therefore imparted intelligibility into that universe and that he created man in his or her image um, with the intelligence to discover how, you know, the, the laws by which he, um, the, the laws he instilled in creation. And uh, though that's basic, that has been basic, uh, the belief assumptions underlying the whole Judeo-Christian view of, of reality, of who we are and who, what creation is and who God is. And um, I just wondered if uh, Professor Matt could comment on this because when he says he seems to be going away from the idea of a personal creator who created us in his or her image and created an intelligible universe. And I think if you deviate from that, um, on what can science be based? So, uh, next question. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I would say, I think to a great extent, theology is projection. You know, we project ourselves onto this, this ground of, of being, and we imagine God. As one person said, uh, God created man in his image, and, and we returned the compliment. <laughs> you know, so what we imagine God to be because of the limits of our imagination. We have imagination. We have awareness. We have what we, call, what we call intelligence. We project that onto the universe or onto the creator. So I, I don't know how we got here, and I don't know really the process by which we got here, but we are here, you know, and I think that, that is significant. The significance is that we are here and we can think. We, we have awareness. So we, I think the challenge is to cultivate that awareness and to constantly check ourselves, to constantly challenge our theological projections. Which to not to accept dogma just because it, it's stated. Now, this sounds more a scientific view than a religious view, but I think religion and science can learn from one another. I think, you know, you know, I think one thing science can learn from religion is a sense of wonder. And one thing religion can learn from science is to question dogma. How, do, how does science proceed? Science makes progress by proving itself wrong. Absolutely. Right? A theory is only a theory if it's falsifiable. That's why you know, Steve and many other people are somewhat skeptical about string theory or other things. Uh, is it something that's really falsifiable? If it's not falsifiable, then, then it's not really ultimately 100% scientific. So I think, I think religion can learn from science that we have to constantly challenge dogma. So I think you're right. I'm really reinventing, I'm really reimagining God. For me, the personal God is simply inadequate. I'm not saying that God does not exist. Just for me, that, that God does not, no longer works. So I'm really reimagining God as energy, the energy that animates the universe. That, to me, is, is a divine reality. The other forms that God takes, for example, the personal God, for example, the God of tradition, I think to a great extent those are people's projections and imaginations. It may be something that people need, and it's dangerous to discard that. But I just I find it more exciting and uplifting to to start with with what is, and to imagine God and from that context. I'm very tempted to let us squeeze in a few more questions, but we've reached the end of the evening. So I think we're going to uh, thank the speakers once again for this. Thank you. Thank you.